Robin, thank you very much for joining me on Forte Podcast. How are you today, sir? I'm good. Good. It's great to be here, finally, in this wonderful place. Yes. Well, I'm glad you mentioned this place. Can you tell us a bit about where we are right now, where we're sitting, and your relationship? Um, so this is Turner Sims, Turner Sims in Southampton. Um, and whilst I am nothing technically to do with Turner Sims and not terribly well appointed to talk about uh, its history or the finer details of its season or its concerts, um, I do sometimes, when there's no global pandemic and lockdown, I do tend to feel like I spend half my working life here. And I, I'm, I'm always grateful uh, to spend so much time in such a wonderful little place. Um, I, so, I, th well, this is, you know, supposedly one of the finest Steinways in the land, um, apparently. I'm no pianist, um, so, but um, lots of people come to uh, play here. I believe that when Radu Lupu, that great legend of pianism, planned uh, a, a UK tour, or was giving a UK tour, what, five, maybe six years ago? He did only two venues in the UK. I believe one was Basingstoke Anvil, and the other was here, I think, because of, because of this. Who wouldn't, Radu Lupu, here on stage. Um, you can imagine, I didn't go to it. Um, my um, girlfriend did, actually, and um, was, of course, completely transported, because he's, you know, he's extraordinary. Um, but, uh, and so people come and record here. Um, the acoustics are really rather special, particularly for, you know, chamber music. I think it was built as a chamber music venue. It's partly underground, so I don't know how many of these seats you can see. So where we're sitting actually is underground, and the doors at the back are on um, ground level, if you like. So I spend so much time here, um, partly through my role as the artistic director and conductor of SON, Son Orchestra that was born here oh, about five years ago and is still currently uh, orchestra in association here in Turner Sims, although we haven't been giving terribly many concerts in here in the last year, although we did do a big Son Weekender, which was actually the final concerts uh, given in here, proper concerts in here with a full audience just before the very first UK lockdown in March of 2020. And for a lot of, our, um, well, for myself and for a lot of our professional musicians was the last gig that we gave for many, many, many months. Um, and um, so we've been doing various series of, of performances in here um, for, for a number of years, including an unwrapped series where we work with often David Owen Norris. It's sometimes been John Suchet. Uh, and we pull apart pieces of music and then perform them complete in the second half. Uh, it's not a new format, it's not our own format, but it's a, it's, it really works for the audience here. And uh, they love it because it gives, um, as I was saying earlier, it gives people a kind of, uh, it gives people a torch uh, and a little bit of an idea about where they might want to shine that as they, are, on what they're looking for, as they explore, uh, as, as they listen more formally in the, in the second half. And so my work with Son Orchestra is uh, kind of pivotal to what I do here in Southampton and in, the, in this hall. And also I work for the University of Southampton. This hall is on the campus of the University of Southampton and it's deeply connected with the university. And I'm a member of staff in the music department. I'm a part-time lecturer and I teach the conductors here at Southampton both. Uh, so I run a second year conducting course that's often taken by third years but it's mainly a second year so and and then i also work one on one with third year conductors and sometimes postgraduate conductors training them and uh, building up their technique and their repertoire and we do all of our classes in here which is a wonderful space to to do such you know what i think is very important teaching hmm. and actually was phenomenally great uh, during the recent lockdown when you know meeting face to face or working face to face or even in the same building with students was for a long time impossible um, we actually started doing some small-scale 
ensemble work in here, very socially distanced, um, in this wonderful space. And it was just so gratifying to be able to teach properly again and be able to demonstrate and, uh, and, and to watch a student work and be able to, you know, um, guide them um, without, you know, some broadband bandwidth problems or jittering or freezing. And it was wonderful. We, we ended up having a little ensemble with two pianos, so there's also a beautiful Spazioli over there somewhere out of view. So we had two pianos, this Steinway and a Fazioli, and a little mini ensemble in some French repertoire, Debussy, uh, Petit Suite, and uh, Ravel Mother Goose. Just little tiny ensembles, you know, all sitting miles apart um, with my conducting students. And it was one of the most f fabulous uh, classes I've had, not least because it was in the face of quite a difficult time, as it has been for everyone. But anyway, yes, this is Turner Sims this wonderful, wonderful building that I really love. I really love. And, I, and, and when I wasn't in here last year, yeah, I really did miss it. Mm. Really did. Has the pandemic and the migration of the music industry, especially teaching, onto Zoom, has that changed your sort of attitude towards physical proximity with making music? Is it something that we, we need that physical proximity in making music and teaching music and educating music? I th yeah, I, I think I understand your question. If, if I answer in a, in a tangential way, then do feel free to sure. steer me back. But uh, yes, hugely so. And I think that I, for one, amongst musicians, and I imagine loads of other musicians out there, um, missed it. And I don't mean music necessarily per se. I mean the whole shebang whether it's teaching or performing or rehearsing uh, in some kind of proximity. Uh, I missed it more than I thought when I started rehearsing again, when I started teaching again, when I started talking about, I don't know, Borodin with a, with a student, um, with, with, a, you know, with a small ensemble or something, you know, was able to, you know, not necessarily go anywhere near that student and, and start moving their arm around and say, well, no, this, you know, you know, you have to be creative. You have to slightly adapt. Of course you do. There's no need to get that close to somebody in order to, to teach anything. Um, I guess unless you're teaching massage, perhaps, or something, but I, I, I don't think that's what I do. Um, but, yeah, it was very... And, and what I felt, and, and I, 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 what I felt since, re, you know, the little trickle of rehearsing has started again, and one or two performances have started again, is I've just felt this liberation. You know, um, it's incredibly freeing. I'm wondering whether the last year or so has been very restorative to me as a musician. I've spoken to some other musician friends who've who felt similarly, who felt, yes, frustrated, yes, disappointed, yes, kind of, to use this word, impotent as an artist, um, silenced and all the rest of it, but also somehow restorative, restored, you know. I spent so much of that time not going near music. I've, I've just, you know, I was... I wasn't avoiding it. I just didn't fancy listening to music up until the music stopped. You know, um, I'd been pretty full on. So the first few months of 2020 for me were gigs, gigs, gigs. I did a huge, huge education project with Son that was based around e-waste, electronic waste. You can find some stuff on YouTube. Um, and we did it. It was a huge education project involving, you know, some orchestra musicians, um, a lot of electronic uh, musicians, uh, including myself, and some Ableton and keyboards, and 85 school kids. And it was huge, because that whole project consumed me utterly. I was composing, I was directing, I was uh, workshopping, and I was kind of project managing. I did the website, and all the rest of it. And, when it, and then kind of like, it all kind of came to a close. And uh, Son did our last gigs in here. They were the last gigs on this stage before the, the, the country went to, into silence, as it were, in March 2020. 
and our gigs were the last ones in here. And uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of thought, right, big line, I can do the garden, I can whatever. And I did for ages, and I didn't realise, I didn't realise how much I missed it all. Unlike, I don't know, I saw Capuçon playing fabulous solo violin, wandering around his back garden on some YouTube Live or something. And I, and I thought, great, good for you, mate. And I, because I kind of thought, what am I going to do? Stand in the, I think it's Danny Meyer from the BBC Symphony Orchestra, did do some silent conducting. He played a game with people every day. He would, I think it was Danny Meyer, um, he would conduct something and say, what's this piece? Which I kind of found fascinating. Uh, and I, I, but it just never crossed my mind to start doing the same thing. I kind of thought, right, I'll leave this to all the people out there that can do better YouTube lives than I can, do better podcasts than I can. I'm just going to sit back. But then when it all started again, or a little bit, I kind of thought, gosh, yeah, I really have missed this. And the teaching too. Gosh, I missed it. I missed that kind of, that thing you cannot, you cannot replicate through a screen. Mm. You absolutely can't come close. It's like there's a huge component of it that's missing. I mean, on the one hand, technology has been our saviour to a certain extent, over the last 12 months. Because much as I might moan about Zoom or Microsoft Teams, other platforms exist, dot, dot, dot. Much as I might moan about them, and boy, I can rant. Without them, can you imagine it? The, the, you, know, you know, frustrating as they have been as, as, as tools, it just nobody would have had a violin lesson for 12 months. Nobody would have had a, you know, and so on and so forth. And, and there, are, there are colleagues of mine, some students of mine, some ex-students of mine, who have been brilliant running like 20, 30, 40 piece choirs over Zoom, where they sit at some, I don't know quite how they do it, they sit at some synth and they, la 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 la. Can, I mean, can you imagine that 10 years ago? That would just, it, everything would have gone completely silent. There have been these, but um, yeah, there's, but despite all that, you know, there is a com component that, and it's to do with that, you use the word proximity. I don't even think it's to do with proximity. I, I think it's to do with energy. I do, I think it's to do with energy. I talk to my conducting students about energy. You know, it's about some, I don't know, Tai Chi flow of energy. I mean, that's what conducting is, ultimately. When you boil it all down to all the, you know, subdivide here and give a better upbeat and buy a shorter baton or, you know, don't look at the horns. You know, it's about energy. It's about the flow of energy. And it's like, I don't know, Qigong, like uh, pushing hands and all the rest of it. No one's leading, no one's following. And it's like a great string quartet. You can't, you can't sense that anything like as well through a screen. You can't. It's, it's missing. It's a key component that's missing. Put it in the room and suddenly you've got that connection. I don't know what it is. It's that magical thing that we all have missed and that enables live art and live music to thrive. And I wonder if there have been so many tragedies in the last 18 months, let's be honest, haven't there? I mean, let's not even begin talking about them. There have been so many tragedies and all the rest of it. But I wonder if some of the benefits has been this restorative neck thing that we're all able to sit back and go, hang on, who am I as an artist? Who am I as a musician? Where have I been as a musician for the last X years? Now I've got this space, right? What does my musical life mean? But also, it gives such an, a refreshed context for what music making is, what collaborating is, what rehearsing is, what learning is, it gives everything a totally refreshed context. And I think that that's incredibly fascinating. And despite the kind of the landscape of people cancelling concerts and this not happening and, you know, people being let down and uh, at the last minute, which I totally get and, and, and all the rest of it, um, I am actually quite excited about the future because I hope that we as a human race and as musicians can carry some of that positivity forwards into our music making for years to come. Maybe I'm being naive, but 
You did answer the question. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, I, I, I took about an hour and a half answering the question. So I'll, I'll, I'll try. I'll try not to. Oh, we'll see. Good luck with no, that. No, 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 no. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting what you said about energy rather than proximity. Before I ask the next question, I want to ask this. Do you think that energy is charisma or not? Musical charisma. I think musical charisma is part of that part of it. Bigger, bigger energy. And I think somebody who... See, charisma is such a weird thing, isn't it? And I'm, I'm no body language expert. Far from it, can't you tell? <laughs> uh, uh, I'm no stage presence guru. Um, you know, I still get criticized for the way I bow on stage. Um, not very often. <laughs> but I mean, you know, I, not all the time. Uh, you know, it's not like there are people in the audience going, oh, gosh, don't bow like, no. But just every once, people say, why do you bow like that? I, 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 ultimately, I don't care. I, I, you know, I, I don't care. But I'm not too concerned about my... I mean, I, I am concerned about the stage shenanigans of who you shake hands with or elbow bump with uh, and in what order and, 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 and forgetting to stand up the solo horn player and all the rest of it. That's important. Um, but that charisma thing... Um, I mean... It's difficult in a way, isn't it? Because I suppose it does go into that camp of things which can't be taught, hmm. arguably. And I suppose things like energy and charisma are things that arguably can't be taught. Although I think that those things are not manipulable, um, I mean, in a good way, not some Machiavellian way. I think, I think they're thing, they are things that can be encouraged or improved through the work of a good coach, a good mentor, a good teacher, uh, or, 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 or increasing your self-awareness as a human, as a musician. You know, if I was really obsessive about it, I would w video every single one of my concerts and watch how I bow at the end, you know, and go, oh yeah, I see, I do that funny thing with my shoulder or something. Um, and I, I've been through, you know, thousands of hours analyzing my conducting using videotape and you know mostly spent going like this going oh gosh why you know and and so on and i try to fix things and they do they get fixed and it's kind of a, a process of you know two steps forwards one step back but that's not about charisma um i think i mean i think charisma i mean it's it's the actor isn't it it's the it, it, it's it's a kind of enabling of a uh, I think it's it's allowing oneself to make the, the the window if you like between what's inside and what people are looking at as transparent as possible um, and I think a lot of it is sometimes it's artifice you know I think a lot of it is manufactured a lot of it is I am not you can not going to use the word false because that's not true. I think a lot of musicians great charisma there's a part of that that's you know not not showboating but it's it's created. You know, I mean there's some great conductors or great performers who've been unbelievably shy human beings. You see them being interviewed and they it's not not that their English is bad for example, they can't they, they don't want to put more than three or four sentences together unlike me, <laughs> currently in this uh, diatribe. But it's because they're naturally um, shy and quiet. And yet on stage, they, they inhabit a, probably a similarly quiet and shy universe, but boy, they can make music. Boy, they can inspire others. Um, and that's their charisma. I think a lot of performers' charisma is often... It can be quite obvious. It can be quite showy. I generally can't stand that kind of performer's way of kind of o overly showy, you know. And I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about the Liberace's of this world or the Andre Rieu. Um, I think actually they, they, they are or were, or were, or whatever way around you, <laughs> they, 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 they were and are um, great at what they do. It's a market. They're very good at it. Um, you know, Liberace was, had, I mean, had a, superb pianist's touch in some ways you know um it's absolutely fascinating to listen to him 
but yeah, I mean, he was showy and then some. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you know, the more uh, mainstream classical artists who I think what I'm more interested in than charisma is authenticity and honesty. And I find when I listen to either some of my students perform or I, w or, or I hear and watch other artists, I, th I think it's really easy if you surrender yourself. I think it's re not necessarily easy, but it, it, it's a skill that we can learn as listeners. I can tell when somebody's lying to me. I can tell when somebody's um, spinning out some bullshit. And I think that what, what I crave in a performance is authenticity. So if I'm sitting at the keyboard and I'm playing some Beethoven, I'm not suggesting that when I'm hammering away in C, C minor, you know, furioso, that, that I am genuinely furious and that I have, you know, some demonic wish to destroy part of this Steinway. Of course it's not. And you're actually a pianist, so you know what that... Or, or when I'm conducting Mahler, I, I don't actually think that, you know, the world is going to end or that I'm experiencing love beyond the horizons of anything I've encountered before. Although those two things, among, you know, amongst thousands of others, are things one can sense and experience in Mahler. I don't feel that. Not, not really deep down. You know, I might look to the bra section like I am pretty cheesed off with them. But, you know, I'm not. It's like it's being an actor. But I think there's a kind of authenticity in being an actor up to a point. I think when it stops being, you know, authentic... I think good, honest, incredible, authentic music making is that's uh, that's the secret. It's quite hard to find, and I think that's what charisma is. That's real charisma mm. in the recording studio or or live. Mm. And I think, yeah, I think to a certain extent that does get lost a little bit through a screen. It can't not. Mm. That's interesting because when I was when I said the word charisma, my mind automatically automatically drew up an image of a very extroverted, flamboyant, showy person. But after hearing you, I think charisma is not just that. It can be um, authenticity and being honest with your work and touching people with your music as well. Yeah. And having that stage presence. Yeah. Although be, being still being shy and introverted, you can still be quite charismatic. I mean, just uh, just off the top of my hat... Uh, off, off, is that a phrase? <laughs> out, out of my hat, off the top of my head, off the top of my hat. <laughs> it's, it's a little Irish. Um, no, uh, whatever the phrase is. Uh, Claudio Bardo, for example. You know, um, I, uh, you know I, I met him only a couple of times. Uh, every time I met him, he was incredibly generous to me. Um, I gate crashed and I was lucky enough to gate crash quite a few of his rehearsals I learned an enormous amount even though he didn't do very much he was renowned for not really doing very much in rehearsals he wasn't like uh, Maris Janssens who I well I suppose Maris Janssens is another great example um, but uh, Abado you know you would never have described him as being some extrovert musician uh, he was a magician not an not an extroverted musician um, but you know even if you didn't agree with every one of his interpretative choices or nuances or or, or so on I, I I'd be troubled about why if if, if, I, if if I'm honest because it was it's always so incredibly subtle um, why anyone would be troubled by his inter anyway um, he just had this humility and this authenticity that would come out and this genuine, you know, I mean, I still remember to this day, and I'll never forget it, perhaps the greatest concert I ever went to was when the Berlin Philharmonic came to the Royal Festival Hall. Oh, decades ago. I, was it their first visit to the festival? I can't remember. But it, it was, I think, well, it was Marlon 9 and it was a bardo and I had seats I had a seat pretty much right behind the the percussion I think it was on the front row of the choir in the festival hall and I was a kid 
I mean by kid, I mean I was 20, maybe 21. And I was sitting there, and uh, I'd never seen him live. I, maybe I had. I think I, I, I think I saw him, uh, Brahms Second Piano Concerto with Brendel, followed by Marla Four. I think that was their proms debut, maybe a year before. You'd have to check the annals of the archives. But, you know, Brahms Second Piano Concerto with Brendel and Marla Four, I think, uh, was the Berlin Philharmonic proms debut with Abardo. And I remember Abardo had to walk out onto the stage alone after the audience all went. I remember they did an encore of uh, Rossini. Was, was it William Tell? And they brought a trombonist just, 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 just for that. I, I, I can't even remember. It may not even have been Rossini. But Abardo came up because the, because the, 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 the applause just wouldn't stop. But anyway, about a year later or something, Festival Hall, Marla Nine. So it wasn't the first time I'd seen him, but it was the first time. And I was just, I, I, I think I barely blinked for the 90 odd minutes of Marla, Marla Nine. And watching Abardo and that orchestra, even though the sound picture is completely wrong, you know, you know when the symbols clash is coming because you're standing right behind the cymbal player who's been kind of getting ready for about 15 bars. But, you know, I ended that performance, or after that performance, I was deeply certain of two things. One, how stunned I was. I still had fingernail imprints in my inner arm f the f following morning. I had no idea how I'd been in this kind of like trance. And the second thing I, I was struck by was I, I just thought to myself, wow, that's, that's what it's like up there at the, at the kind of, at the pinnacle of the profession. I was, I mean, I was still a student. I hadn't even really properly begun studying conducting. Not really. I knew a bit about it. I could waft. I didn't know anything. But yeah, and I just, you know, there he was doing, as he did everything from memory. But it was such honesty, such authenticity, such directness. And it's when all of those kind of boundaries break down. I could spend, you think I can talk now, I could spend hours talking to you about boundaries in music. And the university would probably laugh at me for being so hideously uh, unacademic about it. But boundaries are necessary but they're also so of course constraining and i think that's when we're at our most authentic as musicians is when the boundaries disappear I, and i mean many kinds of boundaries the bar lines disappear i mean isn't it great when that happens i mean sometimes the bar lines are pretty important and they kind of need to be there but people who are driven by and constrained by bar lines i mean really you know the, uh, and, 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 and the boundaries between conductor and orchestra. That boundary shouldn't exist anyway, but it kind of has to. It's a kind of mechanical necessity, but it shouldn't really be anything like the boundary that so many conductors, even today, when despot, despotic conducting should have been disappeared decades ago. It still even exists today. I, I read scare stories about conductors behaving like idiots and morons with orchestras that they're privileged to stand in front of but anyway that boundary should be dissolved and I'm not saying conductors shouldn't exist hmm. um, and also the other other boundaries between between sections of the orchestra or between the, the stage and the audience I mean what's that boundary all about I and mean, I know there are people giving concerts and of course now during a global pandemic is not really the time to start experimenting with innovative layouts do you know what i mean and having but you know i i would i mean kevin appleby the fabulous hall manager here at turner sims I've, I've i've kind of hinted at this with him and i think he doesn't think i'm being serious but i am i, I would love to i mean these wonderful seats here i think turner sims had the seats redone only a couple of years ago and they're fabulous and this yeah all the rest of it um are very quiet you know, as befits a concert hall. But I'd love to, particularly in an education setting, but not just in an education, I would love to have the audience sitting next to the horn player. I'm sure the horn player wouldn't like it. But I'd love and to have some kids sitting in and amongst the violins. 
and getting rid of these boundaries. Because, you know, again, being naive, I, I, I wonder how much will change as, re as a result of the, the kind of uh, hiatus, artistically, of the lockdown and pandemic. But I would love to think that classical musicians can start to really stop the bullshit and, 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 and just get rid of some of these rules. Um, some of these, you know, we've got to sit in this seat and we can't move and we can't clap here and we have to read this programme note, but we can't read it now. You know, and I think the people who, and I used to be one of these people, the people who would moan about people um, coughing during performances or, or not treating Abardo's Marla with sufficient reverence, um, I used to be so, uh, yeah, going to concerts and kind of looking at people who cough and, and, and all of it. Yeah, yeah, you should be able to stifle a cough and everything. But I think if people, if audiences genuinely are uh, invited to be immersed in the whole experience from the beginning to the end, and they're not just given a torch to, to shine around the place and go, oh yeah, that's the bit, yeah, yeah. But they're actually given a, a metaphorical hand to hold. You'll be quite safe. It's gonna be a bit intense. Sometimes it's gonna be quite loud. There'll be bits you don't like. There'll be bits you wished I did a bit faster, because that's how Carl Byrne, or not Carl Byrne, he would do it a bit slower, does it on, whatever. You know, but a hand to hold, so as they feel, in the audience, genuinely transported into the same world. No boundaries, none of that. And I think then you'd have a quieter audience. You'd have an audience that was listening. An audience that listens, that really wants to hear, well, an audience that really isn't making much noise is an audience that's really listening. And an audience that's really listening has an idea of what to listen for. And it's gonna sound really condescending, but I'm gonna use this phrase. They have an idea of how to listen, how to listen. And that, that kind of audience will go on that journey with whoever is on the stage, whether it's Radu Lupu on his own, looking like, I don't know, I guess some hermit bent kind of Glenn Gould-like over the keyboard. I wasn't at that gig, but I can only imagine. Um, or whether it's Abardo and the Berlin Philharmonic, or, 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 or anybody on stage, Nick with Aurora Orchestra, anybody who is making music and, and, and exploring things and taking the audience with them. I think an audience is a, that's bored is, is, I think it's the, it's, it's, it, yeah, it's the fault of the people on stage. Hmm. It's the fault of the people on stage. I mean, this is gonna sound really callous, right? If your audience aren't with you, do something about it. Or, or this is even more callous. If your audience aren't with you, be better. Be much better. And I don't mean be a better pianist, or be a better conductor, or be a better singer, or a better percussionist. No. I mean be better at bringing them with you. Do something different that's going to take your audience where you're going. Speak from the heart, sing from the heart, and be authentic. End of lecture. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know where that. I don't know where that came from. I, I, I think that's one of the big differences between classical music and, let's say, maybe rock and pop music. Is that what you just said? Is the inclusion and immersiveness with the audience and the band themselves? Because you see a lot of bands these days invite their fans on stage and yeah. have have a have a sing a song with them that mm. they that they're really passionate about, or even invite a guitar player from a small a small village who has no opportunities to play with the band and you see how happy they are and yeah. you see all the other fans given support and i find that really interesting what you said about placing the, the children for example next to their say the instrument that they're learning and be sort of in the orchestra and seeing them up close and seeing how everything is around them do you think that's something you could do with song in the future? Oh yeah, it's something that w we've not quite come to the point of. I've wanted to experiment with it, but I but but we haven't. There's still, despite the boundaries that we've already 
it well certainly got to crumble a little bit if not break down there are still inevitable boundaries you know it's a it's a ticket fee paying ticketed audience um there are you know probably i don't know security issues and you know i, I mean i'm not disparaging in any way shape or form about professional musicians uh, i mean talking about professional orchestral musicians i think whilst they are not stunt pilots or brain surgeons um i know full well that they live their lives their professional lives on a knife edge that most people just don't and why would they most people just don't have a clue about because of course if you're a professional musician and you make it look quite difficult then well <laughs> you're not going to get many gigs or there's something wrong unless you're trying to act out something um you, you know and they live their lives on some you know and i'm not just talking about you know the horn players of this world who you know every single time they form an embouchure it's like they take their professional lives in their hands you know i i don't understand how anybody plays that instrument it's a magnificent instrument but you know there but by the grace of god go i my but my point my point is that so they have to and 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 they live in a a, a land a lot of them of you know safety it's a really beautiful balance of, of 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 risk and safety and i think some orchestral musicians live in a, and i'm probably like this too much myself as a conductor live in a land that's too much of, of, of safety because you don't want to take too many risks and you don't want to leave your safety zone um otherwise the wheels come off you know you go around a corner and the wheel comes off and metaphorically speaking you know and so things that are likely to you know sharing the stage with children and animals uh, i don't know um, maybe that's the title of a concert series we could plan that that's a, a series of uh, you know starting with the sound songs um, but you know i mean it does if you book a player i don't know a rank and file fiddle player for a, for an orchestral gig you're going to pay them x and it's going to consist of this many sessions and blah. His repertoire, bring a music stand, whatever. Um, and then suddenly there's five kids at their feet, you know. Uh, it's just, it's, it's a variable that they're not used to handling. If they're booked for an education project, that's slightly different. But I think that that, you know, I'm kind of going around in circles here, but you get my point. I think I, I totally respect and honor the professional orchestral musicians need for that kind of it's a kind of security they want to know when the conductor's going from two into four they want to know that the soloist might do this but might not they want to know that um i don't know that in this hall you really really can't hear the double basses very well i don't mean in this hall you can fabulously well in this hall if you book the right basses uh, i'm just saying in some prefer apparently that's a thing with the concert cabal in um, Amsterdam, apparently. Legendary venue as it is. Apparently half the concert about can't hear the other half of the orchestra, including the double basses, which is a bit of a drawback. But of course they cope with it and they're, you know, the world's finest orchestra at the moment, discuss, dot, dot. Um, they, they want to know that so as they can work around it. Um, I don't know. But I would love... Yeah. I don't know. It's... It's a difficult one, isn't it? I, I, I'd love to, I'd love to try. Mm. I'd love to try, and I, I th well, yeah, we'll see. And I think, I, I think there's still a massive component of, uh, I'll use this phrase, and you'll probably lose half your listenership. There's a massive component of the classical concert-going audience who feel threatened when something new or different might crop up and I totally understand that I completely understand that but and, and, and you can un understand why totally well this isn't the I don't want to listen to Beethoven like this uh, yeah I think that the the fear is that when somebody does a concert for example with the audience, the public, or children, or any of, the, or, or, or animals, God, littering the stage, littering, <laughs> strewn everywhere. 
yeah, in and amongst all the players, I think there's a number of people who will think, well, that's it. More regular concerts or normal concerts, they won't, they won't happen again. I don't think that's ever going to happen. And I think that's the fear, that the minute you put, um, I don't know, uh, a, a, a couple of MacBooks and Ableton and synth players together with an or orchestra, like, uh, I, I don't know, um, Aphex Twin or, or Max Richter or, or uh, Olaf Arnold's or Winged Victory for the Sullen and all that lot, right? Okay, that lot, but you know what I mean? I think there, there are people somewhere going, well, that's it for Beethoven then. That's it for Beethoven orchestras. That's it for the conductor at the front and the soloist there and all the rest of it, an overture, concerto, symphony. Of course it isn't. Of course it isn't. Of, of, of course it isn't. That stuff is never going to die. I just think sometimes we might just reshape it a bit without, you know, without having... We don't need synths on stage yet to do Beethoven. But I, I just think that, yeah. I, I, and, and I think that the classical audience is can be quite a fearful audience. Sorry out there, <laughs> you know, fans of mine, fans of Anthony's, fans of this in wonderful esteemed concert hall. I'll do this direct to camera. Sorry, I'm not, please don't take this personally. I want audiences to come on the journey that I go on as a performer. And I, I, I understand people's fear. Don't be fearful. Yeah? Nobody's going to get rid of Beethoven or concerts. I think that's a, yeah, an understandable but unjustified fear. That we're not, you know. I did that grime opera that I know you, you and I talked about, which was uh, an adventure with Essex Youth Orchestra, which is one of my groups, and a, a grime rapper from Derby called Eyes, E-Y-E-Z, and a um, composer called, Ma called Max Wheeler, who's a, like an uh, electronic composer and com producer from Brighton, and uh, an, an orchestrator and arranger called Pete Riley. And the four of us did this thing. I mean, I was more peripherally involved. Um, Eyes and Max wrote the stuff along with other school kids across Essex over the course of about six months. They went round to schools and they created these grime tracks, grime rap tracks, each three, four, five, six minutes long about various stages on a man's journey. You know, so the, the actual title of the finished piece was called Groan. That's G-R-O-W-N, not groan as in, Ugh, right. right? Groan, a man, right? And, and we ended up with a situation where you had, uh, you know, the 65, 80 players of Essex Youth Orchestra in an old bus garage in Colchester in the summer a couple of years ago. Me conducting with a click track, uh, loads of MacBooks and synths and loads of electronica, really, really cool, funky stuff that I don't fully understand. Um, Pete Riley's amazing orchestrations of Max's brilliant music, all performed by Ice, who's, he was just, there's loads of it on YouTube, um, on my YouTube and, and so on. And uh, Max came out with a comment on social media a couple of weeks later when he was being interviewed somewhere for uh, youth music or something, saying that, you know, I think people are scared that when we do something like that, some wind band somewhere is going to die or some little orchestra is going to collapse and won't exist anymore. And I suddenly thought, yeah, that's, um, okay, so that's the kind of comment that perhaps it's easier for a non-classical musician to come out with. But it's true. It's true. Because um, doing that kind of thing was incredibly important for, they were probably including the choir and, and, the, and, and the kids who were involved in writing those with, co-writing them with eyes. You know, there were probably 250, 300 people most of them young people, like kids, involved in that project. Life-changing, life-changing. They can still go on to their Tuesday night wind band that still carries on. Nothing changes. You know, I think, I think that's what people, is the perceived threat. And I don't, I, I think it's imaginary. I don't, I think, I think music and performance and art should be, it should be doing that. It should be, it, it should always be doing that. A friend of mine, when I was doing a, a, a postgraduate, um, an amazing tenor called Mark Wilde, um, who I've done a few projects with, and actually I was studying at UEA in Norwich, 
um, with him when he was an undergrad. And uh, we were, I uh, guess, sorry, after I uh, left there, I came back and I, I conducted the chamber orchestra uh, in uh, the Britain War Requiem and uh, in Norwich Cathedral. It was, I don't know, yeah, many moons ago. And, uh, and he just said to me, uh, I won't impersonate his, his, his Scottish, but he said to me, gosh, imagine being alive 200 years ago. None of this would exist. It would all have stopped with, you know, um, I don't know, Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven, Schubert, boom. There'd be no Strauss, there'd be no Britain, there'd be no Mahler. Imagine. And I kind of thought, okay, that's a very simplistic view. But yes, it's true. None of that would exist. No Rachmaninoff yet. And it, it just, it should be going like that. It should be going like that. I think people are fearful that oh, it's going like this. Well, it's going like this. It's going, it, it, no, it's not. And, it, and, and as it goes like that, you can either sit there or stand there or listen there and go, wow, look. I can, like Mark Wilde saying, imagine we, you, when it was just, just this, we were kind of like, oh, there's Vivaldi there and there's some Schubert. Oh, great stuff, but you know, that's it. Okay, 200 years later, imagine we, you know, and we now have, you know, Spotify and la 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 and other platforms exist. Oh, wow, imagine. I used to be so disappointed with myself that I didn't know so much music. You know, Verdi Requiem, it's always been a bit of a black hole for me. Never done it. I've played in it as a lowly fiddle player. Never conducted it. It's always been a bit of, for example, there's so much music I don't know. And now, compared to when we started this, compared to when I started this massive like, lecture, there's even more music out there. And it, yeah, a great deal of it is going to be awful. A great deal of it is going to be really awful. The great thing about technology now is that, you know, bedroom composers and bedroom producers are pumping out stuff faster than you and I are breathing. Great. And the only point naught, 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 one percent of it is going to be, oh, wow, that's interesting. Oh, wow, that's, you know. But it's going like that. And, it, and it's all possible. It can all live in the same world. And it could, and it can. And actually, say many things about this building, Turner Sims, and what Kevin does here, you know, you, you have on this stage, you know, when, when, when the season's running as, you know, hopefully it will be any day now or this coming season, you have a vast eclectic kind of mix of stuff. You'll have, the, I don't know, what, 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 what's being cooked up for the new season. Um, but you'll have all sorts of things on this stage. World music, jazz, some really great jazz, some really great world music. Um, not Radu Lupu, but you get the point. You know, um, some of the world's greatest. Paul Lewis comes here a lot because he loves his piano. I think he was, I think he was quite pivotal in, there's a picture of him on the banners in the foyer. You know, I mean, he's, he's not a bad pianist. You know, he's quite a good name. Um, it's just this eclectic mix of stuff, you know. Anyway, I don't know where I went on that fan, but... Yeah, I've, I, yeah, I, I've had colleagues too who criticise a lot of contemporary composers as well because they're, the most common criticism is that it's, uh, it's not music, it's just noise. This is the word that they use, it's noise. Well, it can be sometimes, and sometimes that's actually a good thing. Mm. Sometimes noise, for want of a better word, sound sound that's not quite so formatted in the way that they might wish it to be um, it's, it's a fascinating experience I mean we'll look at John Cage four minutes 33 seconds I've actually never ever been to a performance of that hmm. but I mean so many people including musicians including many musicians think well that's a silly piece isn't it that's daft or why does that exist mm -hmm. Lamont Young letting a butterfly out of a cage you know, I forget which piece that's called, but you know, but the John Cage, it's not, it's not about, it's, it's, it's inviting the listener to experience silence. Whilst somehow there being the, the deep metaphysical knowing in the pit of your stomach that such a thing is actually impossible because the universe is not silent, your body is not silent. And inviting you to contemplate, and then we're, we're back to our, you know, I, was, I won't call it a conversation because I'm not letting you get a word in <laughs> edgewise, but we're back an hour ago, whenever it was, with me talking about how people listen, you know.
But yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. You were talking about n- no, no, no. I, I just yeah. So um, this this sort of reaction against contemporary music and. And you don't really get this reaction when you're in the pop world either, or in the rock world, where there's a lot of experimentation. It's actually met with a lot of positivity, yeah, a lot of encouragement. And I, I found this a very, very intriguing symptom of the classical world. That I've been, for many, many years, I've been trying to sort of diagnose what it is. I, I was wondering if you could possibly oh help gosh. me diagnose it. No, well, I... Sorry, it was my knee. <laughs> It's an old wall wound. Um, <laughs> you, you can edit that out. Um, yeah, you see, I'm not sure I can. And you know, in a funny way, I'm not sure I'm very qualified to or the best place to because there's a lot of contemporary music that I love and I would love to perform, but I don't because of all sorts of problems, expense, uh planning via committee i i think that that's almost entirely my problem of my manufacturing or my failure as an artist to sufficiently overcome that problem i can blame it on well we can't perform that piece because nobody will come and all the rest of it well build up your audience then build up your audience and bring your audience i'm talking to myself here come on robin um, if you get your audience enough on board, they'll come to anything. They'll come to any noise. But I think... So I'm, I, I don't think I'm best placed to do this. I, 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 I think that... I mean, as with, you know, the teenage producers and, and, and so on in their bedrooms. Oh, they don't have to be teenagers, but, you know, and they don't have to be in their bedroom. <laughs> Um, but but you know there's going to be an awful well and and the 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 the, the, the Instagram and and TikTok violinists I mean some of them could be lovely violinists and all the rest of it but they're not all going to be great violinists very far from it um, you know the more content you have the more stuff you have it's not going to you know the the, the pool of quality you know I, I don't know whether that diminishes but it certainly becomes more more spread out you know you look at any mainstream composers um, contemporaries 200 years ago and I'm not well placed to talk about this at all certainly not in this hallowed music department you want somebody I don't know like David Owen Norris sitting here talking about you know um, Beethoven's contemporaries or Mozart's contemporaries and, and who who I've never heard of them when I do those unwrap projects with David O. Norris and we'd, we're unwrapping something, you know, quite standard, um, it's alarming what he comes out with. You know, we did, uh, what the last thing we unwrapped in here was Mozart 41, Jupiter. Um, and yeah, I, oh gosh, I can't actually remember that. I can't remember the name of uh, the composer. He, he dug something up and uh, I got some Sibelius files through and I thought, who's this guy? Who? Who is this guy? It's probably a guy, because let's be honest, women composers back then, women composers now, I mean, don't get me started on that. How long have you got, Anthony? I mean, it's ridiculous. What ca- Woman conductors, please. Uh, oh, yes, and let, for the, for the, um, for the, <laughs> to, to minimize any doubt, I'm very, very much in favor of yes. <laughs> conductors yeah, of <laughs> any, uh, any sex or gender or, or any, skin color or anything i mean wow women conductors just the way that the world still now today right now in july 2021 regards performers and artists of you know uh anyway the, the tangent but i don't know i can't remember who that guy was. but you know contemporaries i guess they're the bedroom com- pr- producers of their of their age and okay fine there's going to be an awful lot of dross being written today. There's going to be an awful lot of crap. I've conducted some of it, naming no names. I mean, I really have. And I don't just mean, and I don't only mean, because there have been some fabulous little pieces written by students um, who've, whose pieces I've been asked to conduct in, in, in various situations. Some of them have been really very good, really very good. And those students have gone on to be, you know, established, successful 
composers. But, I mean, there's an awful lot of dross. You look at a score and you kind of go, really, what are you trying to say? What are you... The, you know, think, th things haven't changed, Anthony. I don't mean that in a, in a grumpy, you know, why aren't there more women conductors out there kind of way, although I... I mean, things haven't changed. Music, as an art form, still has the extraordinary power to, to permeate any shell and walls we build up and go straight in to whatever bit of us the philosophers might call the heart and soul. Music can do that, whether it's uh, Perrotin or Goretzky or Rachmaninoff or Nils Fram or stuff that's being written right now. Nothing's changed. Those rules that aren't even those that, that doesn't change. That doesn't change. And the rapper around that music, the performer, should be the enabler to amplify whatever that original source is. To amplify it, make it more coherent, bring it off the page, bring it to life without being overly charismatic and making it too much about themselves and so on, in order for it to even more readily permeate the skin, shell, wall, boundaries of us as musicians, um, of, of us as humans. That's all that music does. That's all it does. And it has extraordinary power in doing that. That has not changed for centuries. That will not change for centuries. And if people have a voice, if composers have a voice, and they have something not even necessarily original to say, although it would be refreshing sometimes, truly it would be, but if people have something amazing to say or important to say, then they should say it. And it should be out there. And if they say it through... <laughs> to quote you from a few minutes ago, noise, noise of some kind, then, okay, F fine. Get it out there. Someone will, someone will kind of, yeah, yeah, this is amazing. Someone will be into it. I might not be. You might not be. But I think, and I, I, I think that th that's the given to me. That's the kind of, that's the core of what we do as musicians. It doesn't matter. And we go back to boundaries again. One of the things I've always hated, always, and I've had some real late night red wine fueled arguments with people over the years about boundaries. Oh no, well, they're not a Baroque composer. They're pre Baroque. Are they Renaissance? Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? Do you need to put, I don't know, Monteverdi into this box? Oh. Or. Do you think when they were living and breathing life and exuding art as a as 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 a, as a performing musician as a as a as a creative um, force? Do you think they were thinking, "Oh, I can't possibly write these. Uh, I can't I can't possibly write those consecutives there or this because that's just that's a bit more baroque than I." No, no. I, luckily, thankfully, few people think about that nowadays. But you know. Boundaries, boundaries and boxes. It's not. It's not, is it? I mean, look, I mean, is, is this end of the keyboard any more justifiably important than that end? I mean, I personally think this is a, a slightly more important end of the keyboard. I don't know, maybe because my voice is broken, maybe because I like low resonance, I find that a bit tweety and tinkly up there. It starts, But is it? No, it's not. It's all, it's, it's a boundary-free... You know, and if you want to get really um, uh, untempered about this, it, sh it should be like, a, I don't know, like some En Martineau, right? Uh, is that how they work? You know the, th the, you know the thing. I'm not quite sure. No. Do you not know what, an En Martineau? Oh, gosh, no. now you've cut me on. We'll cut this out. <laughs> um, the bit where Robin <laughs> says something to Anthony and doesn't know much about what he's talking about. Um, well, Messian, uh, Torangalila Symphony. Da, 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 dee, da, da, da. Oh, that that that, that, thing. that that thing's a cool. Okay, it's right. called an Ond Ond Martino. Um, and I, I don't know why I'm playing it like this. <laughs> or a theremin, right? Ooh, right. Yeah, like an early Jean-Michel Jarre thing, you know, light harp. 
all, all that kind of stuff, like free, you know? Maybe I just, maybe my, my, my psych personality type is I don't like things in boxes. Mm. I do, actually, in my head. I need order, and as a conductor, you, he heaven forfend if you don't put things into boxes. You won't get booked again, because you won't be able to manage your time, you won't be able to rehearse successfully, you won't be able to do what you need to do by the, you know. So I suppose maybe I'm that odd thing of, of you know, um, I, th I think across boundaries, but I like things to be in boxes when they need to be. But, y you know, I don't even know why I'm talking about boundaries again. Enough, I'm ranting. Back to you. It's, it's interesting that, yeah, on the concert stage, you seem to have no, you don't want boundaries, but in life, away from music, it's quite the opposite, isn't it? Like yeah, yeah. Do, yeah. Do, you, do you sometimes... Sorry, can we get a couch? I kind of feel like <laughs> I should be, um, should I, I should be paying you I for this. Pipes, I need a pipe yeah. spoken. Um, Ant Anthony's um, therapy. But do you sometimes reflect on this, this dual life? Not until you've mentioned it. No, <laughs> no um, yeah, I, yeah, I do. It's not really so much a dual life. I mean, I think... Yeah, life was probably the wrong word, but... Well, the, the way, yeah, the way of living. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important for musicians, professional musicians, to have boundaries. I mean, certainly the last 18 months have shown me that. I'm alarmed by the number of musicians, professional musicians, who've emerged from under their rock uh, recently after, you know, uh, and, and nothing seems to have changed. Mm. They don't seem to have figured out, gosh, if I'm going to carry on doing this in a very unstable, volatile, professional world, I'm going to need some more boundaries. I'm going to need some more rules. I'm going to need some more blah, blah, blah. Nothing has made it clearer to me. Oh, um, well, nothing has been more clearly made... Edit. Nothing has been made more clear to me over the last 18 months than the gulf between professional freelancers, and I don't just mean musicians, but I'm talking as one, so I mean professional freelance musicians, but freelance artists, freelance poets, freelance rappers, freelance, I don't know, plasterers, and salaried people, people who are on a salary, people who are earning blah. Now, don't we get all political about this, but I have never seen that gulf writ so large as I have in the last 18 months. Now, the difficulty for us musicians over the last 18 months is that, yes, I realise everybody has suffered, and then some, and I've, you know, I've, I've got away virtually scot-free. You know, I haven't, you know, apart from losing all my work, you know, I've not suffered uh, health-wise. I've known many people who have. So I'm not trying to say that, you know, oh, life is, no. But the difficulty is, is that our entire, not just our income, and our living, but our reason for being, because that's what people don't really think artists are. They just think that we're having a bit of fun, or we can do it because we can. Or th th it's, it's not like music, it's not like I chose to be a musician. Music chose me at a really early age. Music came to me in the night. It visited me in my dreams. I don't know. I remember my dad playing. I think it was a piece of Scarlatti. I, I, I remember my, one of my earliest memories was of my dad on the turntable. And I was just obsessed with some... And it probably wasn't Scarlatti. For all I know, it could have been... Let's just pretend it was Scarlatti. In Cyprus, when I was a, a wee nipper, I would have been four or five, and I was obsessed with it. And I kept asking him to play this. So I think my early obsession with minimalism and loops started there with the turntable, this kind of like cycling start. But, you know, I remember then, I can remember that vividly. Well, kind of, because I can't remember who it was, but the composer I'm in. But that was, that, was a, that was there. There was a kind of, there was something about me and sound. And, and I just wanted to jump into it, like uh, into the swimming pool or paddling pool, as it probably would have been then. I wanted to just jump in and immerse myself in that sound. I didn't choose that, necessarily. No, I didn't. It kind of chose me. So I, I think it's... So when you lose all of that as, a, as an artist, when you lose that, you don't just lose, of course, your, your income and your regularity you lose your i'm sorry this is going to sound like an exaggeration but it is not you lose your whole purpose in life you lose your whole reason for getting out of bed in the morning 
even if I get out of bed and don't think about music and I listen to Radio 5, I am still a musician. I think I may have forgotten that quite a few times in the last 18 months, actually. But I haven't forgotten it now. And it's not easy to lose all that stuff. And so it's not like, you know, I don't know, a plasterer doesn't get, you know, that, that inner, like, touch paper doesn't get lit and fueled and fanned when they're four. Maybe it does. Maybe there are some plasterers out there who've been yearning for it. But I'm not, and I'm not disparaging about plasterers. You know, they're, they're, they're artists of a certain kind too, and some of them are absolutely brilliant and work a hell of a lot harder than I do. But my point is, is that, you know, when you lose all that, it's just bang. And, and yet there are people everywhere who just don't even, they don't make the effort to see what it's like to be that freelancer because they're existing in some world of salaried, I'm sorry, I'm going to use this word, salaried privilege. And it's only a privilege um, because, you know, I mean, it, over the last 18 months, it certainly has felt like it's a privileged situation. You know you're going to get that amount of money. No artist has ever really lived in that world. I mean, if you're music director of a big American orchestra, yeah, maybe, all the rest of it. But I'm sorry to get all political about this, but it's really important because we musicians need to wake up. Because otherwise it doesn't matter about the one in 100,000 bedroom composers who suddenly writes amazing stuff that comes out in 10 years' time and everyone's clamoring to perform it and make commissions from, 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 from that person, you know, um, there'll be fewer musicians around to perform it. There'll be fewer people to do it because half of the profession will have given up because they'll have gone, you know what, I've had enough. This may be my calling, but I need to pay the bills. And... Um, it's never before has that been so stark. And I'd like to think that I've woken up a bit. And yeah, I've emerged from my post-COVID, although COVID is far from gone, my post-lockdown rock, starting to work with groups again and ensembles and orchestras and programmers and committees and so on. And I, yeah, I have been a bit zealous in, in standing my ground, guarding my position and saying, well, if that's what you need, we're going to have to renegotiate that because I don't want to be in that really bad situation where I put in all this work and then that just gets, th th then that gets cancelled. Mm. And that's not just time that I've Im invested in. Masses of time to program for an orchestra takes a lot of time, a lot of time, unless you couldn't care less, in which case you can do it on the back of a fag packet, right? Programming for an orchestra takes a lot of time because there are so many plates to spin. But it's also the emotional investment. It's an emotional investment. If you don't program with some degree of emotional investment, then I don't think you're doing it right. Maybe I'm too emotionally invested. But I mean, if you're planning an entire concert season, right, if you're planning an entire concert season with all sorts of orchestras, if you're sitting there going, yeah, I'll be so Rispigi and that Ludoslavsky, I haven't done that for a while, yeah, the audience won't like it, but I'll talk to them beforehand and get them on board and the treasurer will hate me because it'll cost a lot of money and blah, 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 and we'll do that and we'll get that soloist and da, 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 great, like moving around uh, pieces of jigsaw puzzle, great, I can turn on the TV then. You can't program like that. You've got to be really open-minded and go, wow, am I passionate about that? Am I going to be, how am I going to feel about doing that in six months' time? Am I going to be ready to do Eroica? Right? Eroica. I mean, always up there amongst conductors, Eroica. Ne the minute Eroica doesn't feel like it's right up there for a conductor, it's probably the time to hang up your stick. Eroica always, I mean, even amongst other Beethoven symphonies, it's always special. It's always, hmm. And it's always going to have that taste for me, that patina. I, I've never walked off stage after doing Eroica and not felt a little bit disappointed with myself, ever. I remember the, 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 the Im immortal words of George Hurst, with whom I studied quite a bit, um, when he was teaching us, uh, although I thankfully wasn't conducting at the time. But somebody was conducting some Beethoven, I think it was the Egmont Overture, I don't know, at Canford or something like that. And um, 
And George just kind of started doing his, there aren't, there aren't arms on this chair. We started banging his hands on his going, you're, it's, and I won't shout because I'll ruin all your <laughs> levels. He's, he, but he shouted, you're conducting Beethoven. Don't look at the players. Don't look at the ceiling. Look at the floor. Uh, or words to that effect. And I remember, you know, I mean, if you're, if you're planning a program, and you, a lot, I think a lot of people plan a program based on, you know, a classic FM top 50 list. And you know, why not? It's a really useful resource. At least you know your audience might have heard of it, which is either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your point of view, on where you, what your direction is. But it's got to mean something to you. And you're a pianist. You're a, you know, I mean, I assume you're doing a lot of solo piano. Yes. I mean, I would argue, I mean, I don't know statistics, there's more likely to be solo piano than there is probably any other instrument except maybe guitarists, but probably more than guitarists, I don't know. Um, I mean, I know you can play piano quartets and um, concertos and all the rest of it, but, you know, but when you program, do you think exclusively of, I mean, what do you think about when you're putting together a recital program or a final performance program? You've got to think about a number of different things, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I recently spoke to Philip Folk and I watched a lot of his stuff and he has a position that he, he doesn't like this uh, sort of strict programming. He just wants to play what he likes to play, what he really feels like he really wants to play. And I, I've had this feeling a lot, but it was sort of suppressed during my conservatory days because that wasn't the general consensus around the department. They were sort of programming in this way that three-star Michelin chefs did. And mm. somehow that didn't quite click with me. I, I really wanted to play music that really meant a lot to me. Right. So you didn't want to, sorry to interrupt, you didn't want to just tick the boxes of a conservatory examiner? Yes, yes. Or, 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 but, but were you uh, totally... You were completely, or were you just, were you, were you ignoring that, or you were just going, okay, I'll bear that in mind, but I want to do what I, wh it's got to float my boat too. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So it's finding that sort of, that knife edge between pleasing the examiners and also pleasing my sort of approach to music. And um, th that's just always been the case because music, m I, I really need to connect with the music if yeah. I want to perform it. Emotionally. Emotionally. Yeah, on some level. On some level. And... But can I ask you then, what does that feel like? Can you, could you try to put that into words? I don't mean the process of programming, although that's an important question, I suppose. What does, the emo what does emotional connection with something you are considering performing feel like? It doesn't feel like I'm playing the piano. Right. Interesting. It doesn't feel like I'm playing an instrument. It feels like an extension of me. And the image of an instrument just completely dissolves. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't Boundaries, feel like that. Boundaries, see? yeah. Doesn't, it doesn't feel like I'm playing an Composer, instrument. instrument, performer. When you're connected, it's, it's, yeah, the boundaries are gone. But when I'm, when I'm told to play something, then it's I'm playing an instrument. I suppose just uh, as a tangential thought that's just come into my yes. head just as you were saying that, I suppose if you take one of the most pure and going back some moons here, authentic, <laughs> yes. honest ways of making musician. You take a folk singer who is pretty much improvising and singing their own stuff. They, they're, they're basically either writing the poetry or the words and, and, or, or they're improvising something. Hmm. It's a complete fusing of all of those disparate elements isn't it? I mean, this is something that's been known about, you know, the breakdown between composer and performer. It should be one, one, one thing, one person, you know, what, whatever. But I mean, th and it, th that's often some of the most um, touching and, and humble and, and, and uh, ways of expressing yourself mm. uh, to sing, which of course then uh, eliminates the boundary between uh, performer an instrument because you're singing it's your voice it's a deep connection but I suppose so I mean that's a kind of a nice little example but I suppose for, for, for good for, for what you're talking about and what I, ultimately I'm talking because I agree with you 
that's, that's one of our chief aims as musicians, as programmers, isn't it? Is, mm. to, is to feel like you no longer exist, your instrument no longer exists, and the music no longer exists. Because it's all kind of like, ooh, sorry, microphone. It's all in some kind of beautiful soup. Mm. That's exactly it. Yeah. Yes. There you go. Beautiful soup. <laughs> I th think I should rename your podcast. Beautiful, <laughs> Beautiful soup. But you know that. But that's right because it's an emotional connection. I mean Stravinsky. Now that you ask, sorry, <laughs> not that you ask Stravinsky. I mean I can. Sorry, I'm not a fan. I, I mean I admire. I've got a lot of Stravinsky on my shelves, both recordings and scores. I've performed a lot of Stravinsky. I admire Stravinsky. I res it's just h incredible stuff. It doesn't really do anything for me. Unlike so many of these younger conductors who are kind of like just so desperately keen to perform the Rite of Spring, mm. <laughs> like a you know like a forex trader is desperate to drive a Lamborghini. It's the same kind of mm, tes testosterone fueled. Um, I, I, I mean, I've conducted it a few times. It's never, I've never enjoyed it. And that's not because it's really difficult and it's tricky to learn or to rehearse or all the rest of it. It doesn't, um, yeah. I don't like the sound it makes, you know, which sounds like something my mother would say. <laughs> it's a very English, English uh, comment, isn't it? But I... I mean, I admire the sound it makes. There are, there, are, there are some sounds in there that are just absolutely extraordinary. And there are sounds in Stravinsky that are mind-blowing, that, that nobody else, certainly at the time, could create, could, could conceive of. Um, I, I, I completely understand that on, a, on an objective level. It's just, wow. But I cannot, and this is the key thing about being, an art, or, uh, being a human, you cannot m manufacture the emotion. You can't manu You can pretend to manufacture the emotion, or you can pretend, full stop, but it will always be manufactured. And of course, there are limits, because if you conduct Mahler with no emotional boundaries whatsoever, then you're absolutely precious little use to your orchestra. I mean, you'll be in, you know, I think Bernstein said, I mean, one of the greatest, you know, um, uh, emotion fueled human beings that's ever tr stepped onto a concert stage. And I love Bernstein and then some. But I mean, even he said that, you know, words to that effect the minute you start being emotional on stage, you are useless to them. I mean, be being, I think, yeah, let's uh, add a little. Um, qualifier that being too emotional you know the minute you start breaking down in floods of tears or end of mile or two i remember the first time i saw this uh, video and i got it on vhs tape which dates me and it of bernstein conducting mile or two um i think it was lso at the edinburgh uh, edinburgh um, where was it it was with the Edinburgh Festival Chorus, that's for sure. Um, in some cathedral, I forget which one, from the 70s. And uh, it's just, it, you just watch him conduct the ending. And uh, having complained that our world is too visual a world earlier on, it's, I mean, if ever you see a human being 100% inhabiting the emotional and physical world of what what is being created around them or recreated around them. I mean, that the man looks like he's about to begin levitating. You should really watch. I mean, if, ideally, if you're going to do Mahler 2, you need to do the whole symphony. Otherwise, you can't just plunge in for the last 10 minutes. But uh, it's well worth, worth a, a, a watch. I'll, I'll never forget it. I haven't watched it for years, but it's still imprinted somewhere on my memory of this. Yeah. And, uh, and again, you know, charisma, honest music making. But anyway, so how do we get there from boundaries? I like things in boxes just because otherwise if you, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, because if, you, if, you're, if you're not so much personal life, your private life, if your professional life is chaos, 
then your musical life is going to be chaos. Mm. Mm. You need to have a good diary. You need to have a good manager, if you have one. I do. Fabulous woman. Um, uh, you, need to have a, you need to have somebody who can... If you aren't organised, then you damn well need to have somebody who can be organised for you, whether it's a wife or a husband or a partner or a, or a sibling or a manager. But ideally... You know, and again, if the last 18 months has taught us musicians anything, sort it out. Sort it out. The tangent, but this is a really big one. When, when the lockdown came, right, when the lockdown first appeared in this country, the number of musicians, colleagues, some of them, friends, some of them, that I saw on social media saying, but how do I deal with this tax thing? How do I deal with this? And, and w Rishi Sunak has done this, but how does this work? Look... You can be a musician and say, I'm a musician, I've got an accountant and a bookkeeper, I don't want to know about the money, stick my head in the sand, right? Fine, until something like this happens, when suddenly, woe betide you if you haven't figured out the, 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 the deep machinations of how you're paid, how you're not paid, how you're contracted, how, the, how you're taxed. Sort it out, because why shouldn't you? It's, you know, I, I, I don't know, unless you're Lang Lang, who's probably got 12 tax lawyers who, who follows him around the globe, and he can just throw, he probably doesn't even pay for anything. He's got somebody to do it. Sorry, Lang Lang, if you're listening. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, come on the show next. <laughs> yeah, he does a very good podcast, right? Um, <sighs> play this piano, maybe. No, no. Um, right, anyway, focus. Right, but, but, you know, unless you're like that, you're, it's your money. It's your money. It's your tax. There's, you know, if, if, if you're a business person, which you should be and you are as a musician anyway, you should be a business person. But so many musicians think, oh, I'm, a mu I'm a musician. I don't need to think about all of this. And the number of people at the start of the, 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 the lockdown who were going, but what, like headless chickens. And the other thing was about, I've got to suddenly start teaching on, on via Zoom, right? What is Zoom? Oh, I need a computer for that. What's a computer? Now, you can say, yes, I'm a musician. All I need is my piano and my, you know, my shelves of Chopin. Great. Fabulous. Now you are suffering from your lack of desire to learn. To learn. To learn what you need to learn in order to grow when something bad like this happens. And I don't... I think... So many musicians, they go to music college, they go to music college postgraduate, and then they blah, and then somehow they stop learning. Hmm. They stop learning. They might start teaching. You know, and as Bernstein said, you know, when I teach, I learn. Great. But that's Bernstein. That man never stopped learning until he was in his coffin. Right? I mean, I can think of a, I can think of a few greater examples of a learner, lifelong learner, than Leonard Bernstein, because he was such a polyglot, lifelong um, teacher but but so many like stop learning and I don't need to learn about tax my accountant does it I need to need to learn well it, since when has this been a job for life you've got to reinvent yourself as musicians out there constantly reinvent yourself constantly because sorry yeah yes yes no I, I like I think that's um I think Sort of that sort that sort of first principle thinking. You know, what what do I have in my home? What can I make use of? What can I? They don't. They don't. People don't. I'm not. I hate to generalize, but uh, most people don't really think from the first principles. Okay, what do I have? What can what can I do? Stepwise, that can make me achieve this this goal that I have. And like you said, people just just automatically shut down when there's new things being thrown at them, and they don't, they don't take the time to think about. Okay, what it is that I have? And what, what it is that I have, what can they do? It amazes me, Anthony, yeah. you know, that, you know, th this is quite an extraordinary creation of human uh, scientific, mechanical, and artistic um, uh, prowess. Th th this, this, this piano, or these pianos. But, you know, so is a Stradivarius, or so is a, you know... A, so is the human voice, I suppose. But we as musicians, we spend a lifetime, and it is a lifetime, learning this. 
and building and building and building, layer upon layer upon layer upon layer, searching, you know, I mean, we are, as musicians, we, by the time we leave music college or university and reach our, I don't know, mid-twenties, late-twenties, whatever, time scale's a bit flexible, isn't it? I, I think that we have gone on one of the most extraordinary learning curves of all human beings. We've had to. Because we've probably started learning. When did you start learning the piano? Eleven. Eleven. So strangely, you and I, as the only two people on this podcast, are, I think, quite exceptions. Because most people who are successful professional musicians will have started learning when they were much younger. Yeah. Now, I was 11, almost 12, when I started learning the violin. And I took to it like a duck to water. Um, and 11 is, I mean... Pretty late. Yeah, yeah really late. relatively speaking. There are, you know, there are kids, I, I don't know, how old was Lang Lang? Oh. Phone in Lang Lang, if you know the qu answer to this question, <laughs> send a tweet to Anthony. How old were you when you started learning the piano, Lang Lang? But he would have been, you know, probably. Isn't there some videos of him? Yeah, know, playing some ridiculous... When yeah. he was like two months old or something. <laughs> no, but, but the thing is, that we've, as musicians, we've gone on... And, we, you know, we've learned this since a, a young... I mean, even 11 or 12. That, that's young to start on your journey. And, you know, we've learned this and we've learned how to learn. I mean, for some of us, we may not know quite how we do it, but for others amongst us as musicians, we've really figured out how to learn because we've had to deconstruct it and codify it in order to teach others. But we've not just learned, we've learned how to learn. Now that sounds like a, a tongue twister. We've not just learned how to do the stuff. We've learned how our brains can maximize uh, results with minimal time. I mean, minimal time being sometimes five, six, seven hours a day, yes. But when you're learning all four Rachmaninoff concertos and the rap on a pag, you know, you're going to need some time, yep. for example. You know, we, we, and so therefore often as teachers, we know how to teach because, but, but everyone's different. Everyone has different learning styles. What shocks me is, so, and, and this is not easy to learn, <laughs> You know, and I keep pointing to the piano, but it could be violin. Uh, conducting, you know. I look at my students conduct, some of them, and I think, gosh, I wish I could conduct like that. I won't name any names, because they'll all be watching this, all of them. But I can think of some conductors who learn in just a couple of weeks, and I think, gosh, it took me a few years to get out of n n doing that dodgy habit that they've seemed to have fixed in a week. How? Well, they learn. They've learned how to learn, Yeah. Yes, they might have a relatively good teacher who is quite, I th like to think as a teacher, I'm quite flexible in adapting what I deliver to the person, to the poor unfortunate victim that I'm trying to coerce into doing something. But, you know, we've, we've, we can do, it's just really difficult, incredibly difficult, just on a, it's sport, isn't it? I mean, when you look at, I don't know, violin playing competitions these days, right? It just that there's, there's less physical prowess on display at Wimbledon in the tennis finals than there are in those things. So you, get, you look at some of those people play the violin and you think, gosh, how can they just, I mean, just, you know, and, and whilst sometimes we might as musicians doubt that everybody has a deeply resonating artistic message or deeply understands what they're trying to say in the Beethoven Violin Concerto, um, I think there's no doubt that from a technical point of view, humans are, it's like, you know, on the running track, they're getting faster and faster. And not from a technical point of view, you know, musical technique is generally increasing and increasing. It's easier to learn things that are incredibly complex that little bit faster. But what shocks me is that musicians get to a certain point and then they stop. Then they stop. I mean, where has all that fascination and curiosity that made them be a musician in the first place? Where's it all gone? And I'm not saying that every musician out there is like that. Of course not. But start learning. Even if it's really boring stuff, like your tax affairs, 
because you are going to need it. You are going to need it. Or how to construct a relatively healthy social media career um, um, platform. I mean, I haven't tweeted properly for about 12 months, but so... But, you know, musicians, you know, it's, whether you like it or not is not relevant. Whether you like tax or not is not relevant. You have got to deal with it. You're going to be a professional, self-employed, freelance business person. And so many musicians think, I'm an artist, I don't need to, I, mean, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, I don't need to deal with that, S-H-I-T. I'm an artist, don't you know? Yeah, you are an artist, but unless you are Lang Lang, you are going to need to deal with it. Get your hands dirty, figure out what the problem is, and then you won't be in a muddy mire next time there's a global lockdown. You'll be able to figure it out. Sorry about the ranting, but it does bother me because we're our own worst enemies. We seem to think that being an artist and understanding finances or understanding contracts or understanding how to compartmentalise our professional life so we don't miss appointments, double book ourselves, or turn up late, that they're two different things. It's the boundaries again. <laughs> it is. You've got to have these, you, you've got, I mean, to be a conductor means many things, right? Being a conductor means many, many, many things. But you know one of the most important things I get my conducting students uh, and to, to, to invest in? One of these, it's called a wristwatch. Even pressing an iPhone button or whatever to remind yourself of the time right, is an extra gesture as a conductor when you can just go like that or you can just have it on the stand. If you do not monitor your time as a conductor, you will fall foul of most of the orchestra. You cannot overrun. And what's almost worse than overrunning is, is a really badly paced rehearsal where people stand around and do nothing, nothing gets done, a bit of play through, and then the conductor goes, <gasps> right, <clears throat> it's bad, it's bad. There are some great conductors who are strangers to a wristwatch and yet are amazing conductors and amazing musicians. Valery Gergiev is one of them. But they're rare. And until you're in that zone, like him, Lang Lang, buy a wristwatch. Put things in boxes. Manage your time. Strategize. Because the one thing that we are all gifted with as musicians is technique and artistry. That should be a given. That should be a given. The one thing so many of us as musicians are really bad at is the other stuff. That if you're lucky, really, really, really lucky, and that's not going to be many of us, you can outsource to a manager or an assistant. Most of us have to run our own show. And the number of times as a conductor I've... Some musicians, I mean, I love them to bits because they're my greatest friends. I share the stage with them. I have the honor and privilege of spending time with them, whether they're in an orchestra I conduct or they're a soloist or they're composers whose works I'm lucky enough to be entrusted with. So please don't get me wrong because musicians, I mean, this is all about, but some musicians are their own worst enemy. I'll book somebody for a concert. Nothing comes back. Okay, sometimes it's because the fee isn't to their taste or because the fee last time was insulting to them or whatever. They've got some axe to grind with me. But really, are you so busy that you can't text back within 24 hours saying, sorry, not free? And, I mean, really, I just... So many great musicians who I've had the privilege to work with go into some blacklist of people I will not text again because I just think they're not worth it. If you're not going to respond to me, right, come on. I mean, do, do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Do you want the work or not? Because, and this is another thing that so many people, including musicians, don't seem to get. This is work. It's work. Now, you said 20 minutes ago that when you want to be emotionally connected to your music, you want to be... This dissolves, and this dissolves, and that dissolves. Now that is, that's almost like, that's not work, that's play. And that's how we should all feel when we're on stage, when we're sitting at this, or when we're conducting, when we're in the middle of something, because that is the opposite end of the spectrum. That is about as far away from work as it's possible to be. It is play, but it's play and then some. It's like play in artistic heaven. But if you don't get the other bit right, 
you're never going to be able to spend much time or as much time as you might wish here. So musicians who don't get this bit right and do their admin, send their invoices, return that call, sort out that e email. I could be shocking with emails sometimes, but hey. But you know, if we if if we don't, then we won't get booked again. And I don't understand. This is the hard thing, right? You've got the hard bit right. Assuming you're anything of a musician, I don't mean you personally. I mean whoever's listening to this. It, you know, just it's so easy, isn't it, to respond to a message? That's just admin. That's just timekeeping, and that's the bland stuff. Anyway.